Hi, I'm Mike Baker. This is National Arts, and we are on Broadway. The beautifully crafted off-Broadway show, All Under Heaven, addresses the profound contributions writer Pearl S. Buck made to 20th century literature and to Chinese and American society as a whole. From her Nobel Prize for Literature to her unparalleled efforts on behalf of Asian American children, African American civil rights, the Equal Rights Amendment, and the nuclear test ban, Pearl Buck's diplomacy helped shape our consciousness as a nation and the world at large. Not surprisingly, All Under Heaven has been warmly received by readers and theatergoers alike. Written by Dick Garrison with Valerie Harper, All Under Heaven recounts much of Pearl's life as a child, her Nobel and Pulitzer Prize winning work, and her efforts as one of this century's greatest humanitarians. When I won the Nobel Prize, I remember thinking to myself, oh, now you're really on track, Pearl. Valerie, is it true that All Under Heaven all came about because of a Christmas card from Carol and Dom DeLuise? <laughs> in okay. part, okay. certainly in part. It boils down to Tony Cacciati, my husband, having the good thought to say, you know, if you're going to do a one-person show, Valerie, what about Pearl S. Buck? It was really his idea. But she was in my consciousness because of darling Carol DeLuise, who's very active with the Pearl S. Buck Foundation. Often they would send a donation has been made in your name from Dom and myself, Carol, uh, to, uh, for the Pearl S. Buck Foundation. And there would be her picture holding a mixed race child. And I say, oh, wow, my mother's favorite author, still contributing long after she's dead because of the way she set up not only her life's work, but her legacy to continue. And I thought, you know, so, so when, um, her name came up. I said, oh, yes, of course. And of course, that's how the Carol De Louise, Dom De Louise connection. So it, it, it definitely in part, because it, it, she was very alive for me because of them. Mentioning that your mother was involved in the Book of the Month Club and Pearl Buck was one <laughs> yes. of our favorite authors, do you ever think that somehow, even in those early stages, this was to be your legacy years down the road? Absolutely, without question. I remember my mother with her little Irish McConnell was our her her family name, glittering blue eyes, going, oh, I just love Pearl Buck. She's so wonderful. She speaks to me, Val. She speaks to me. And she did. She spoke to many women and men, but women. Uh, one of the, um, by a wonderful biographer, Peter Kahn, who wrote uh, Pearl S. Buck, a cultural biography. It came about, out about two years ago. Wonderful, wonderful reviews. Um, he said that in his research, he went to librarians all over the country, and they all said, oh, my mother's favorite writer. Not one said, my father's favorite writer. So it, she really did uh, write about women in a way they never had been. And I think my mother in that transitory generation, who in the 20s was kicking up her heels, she was a flapper, they bobbed their hair, they came out of, she was born in 1910. That group really... Uh, embrace Pearl because she embraced them and their concerns. But I mean no trouble, less trouble than a chicken, less trouble even than an egg. Oh, thank you, thank you, wise mother. You are most generous. I have no one in the world except for you and the little one who is coming. I did not wish to take the woman in, but she had lost all five of her children in 10 days. Tetanus, the 10 day madness they called it, and she was truly alone in the world. And in so many ways, Pearl Buck is our mother earth, isn't she? Oh, I think so, oh my gosh. She raised concepts of, uh, I think, global village and international citizenship and just the, the connectedness of all the human family and that this centimeter of difference is such a ridiculous basis upon which to place, you know, our uh, views of politics or whatever. So she just was really an incredible, incredible citizen, a global citizen of the first order and put out all kinds of, um, not just her writings, but her actions on that purpose line of us becoming as my, the title of our play, All Under Heaven. The rest of it is We Are One. It is, it's an ancient Confucian. I think it's even before Confucius. Um, All Under Heaven, We Are But One Family. Because the work isn't done. That's right, it isn't. Because oh, no. we haven't, at least from a racial point of view, come to embrace everyone. Nope. So it's an ellipse. Yes. It's not finished. 
Yes, exactly, and it's ongoing. And uh, she was such a student of history, and that's what's fun in our show. I think people we wear our research pretty lightly because I'm very aware that the theater must be entertaining and engaging, and it must be. This I'm in for thrills and chills tears and laughs, and I think we have it in our evening, but through there is laced the history, because her life was so, you know, profoundly spanning from 1892 to 1973. She's a litany of the century. She really is. Politically, culturally, everything. And was way ahead of her time, but maybe the rest of us were just behind. I think often people in their time telling the truth are simply being candid, truthful and honest to the depths of their humanity rather than they're ahead of us. It's that a lot of people were, are, are dragging, drag kicking and screaming into the present moment. As Buck, you have this wonderful line about how she writes that she immerses herself in the work and then having finished she awakens to the real world. That's the way the playwright has fashioned this piece and that's the way you portray it. That's you immerse right. yourself in these various Eastern and Western characters and then you awake to the audience. That's correct. It's, oh my gosh, how wonderful. That's it. That's it. She talks about them living in your head mm -hmm. and you want to brush them aside and wake to real people and real life. It's right at the top. Good. You're a wonderful theater. Girl, you're really listening, but that's good. I, I love your analysis. I don't think we consciously did that, but maybe we did, you know, because that's what we were trying to do. We decided that instead of keeping me all evening in a gray wig saying, and then I wrote, you know, at 79, let us let these people live. And, and the director and I, we had long things. Is, is it weird to do Will Rogers or Nixon with a gray wig looking like an elderly woman? And, and it isn't because it's her memory and the audience's wonderful willingness to suspend disbelief and come along. That has warmed the cockles of my heart, as they say. It really has. I'm so uh, thrilled uh, with the response. I adopted first my daughter, Janice, Oh, tiny little thing. It was not expected to live. And then when I married Dick, why, we adopted first young Richard, then John, Edgar, and Jean, Henriette, then Chaco. Seven in all. Our old farmhouse was just full, bursting with love and commotion and laughter. In the play, you speak this wonderful truism that's right out of the mouth of Pearl Buck, and that is, <laughs> Every child deserves a home of laughter and love. That's right. Regardless of the circumstances of its birth, and no child should be suffer because its parents' uh, irresponsibility. There's a whole long speech that we had to cut that was wonderful about its cruelty. It's cruel at a child at its moment of conception to just, in a moment of either pleasure or abandon, entertainment, you call forth a life and then you abandon it and don't, ha it, there's no place for it. And with the Eurasian children, Amerasian children, um, of the, the sons and daughters of our American servicemen who were there, they were completely uh, cut out of their own societies. So they were between cultures and uh, America didn't want them and neither did their homelands. So Pearl, literally a one man band, with the help of Oscar Hammerstein and James Michener, people in the arts, they formed this incredible little triumvirate, other neighbors, and they started uh, finding homes in America because we're a pluralistic society. We really are all different shapes and colors, and viva America for that reason, but those children could have a life here. Because she was in a racial minority in China at an early age, oh. and she saw poverty uh, that perhaps no one on this continent had seen, I got the feeling that as she matured and got older, that when she came into the Western society, it was almost like a knife through butter. Nothing could stand in her way. <laughs> Nothing that she would see would be a daunting task for her. That's right. She'd seen lepers. Mm -hmm. She had found babies that had been put on the hillside because they were girls. And uh, one time she attempted to bury one because dogs were trying to eat the little body. I mean, she, at, very, at a young age, Absolutely right, Mike. So she had this expanded consciousness, and instead of going inward, she found a way to communicate it through storytelling, and then later through organization after organization after an organization. She's an American we can be so proud of, really. And, and when she came here and saw the um, African-American at that time, uh, the Negro experience, 
she completely understood because she had been spit upon and called, you know, ugly foreign devil with wild beast eyes. Anyone with our color eyes in that culture looked like an animal to them because tigers had green or, or light eyes, but human beings' eyes were black because that's all the human beings we have. Black hair, black eyes, that is a human coloring. So th that, you know, she was called yellow-headed and, you know, foreign devil. And so she totally understood when she came here. And here it was amazing because these folks had built our country, African-Americans, on their backs, along with other racial groups that came from Europe, et cetera. And they were supposedly citizens and being treated this way. She was almost like an interloper. The missionaries went to China to try to convert, and it wasn't their country. So she was appalled that uh, black Americans were so in such terrible circumstance with their governments, their government condoning it. So she fought rapidly and forcefully and with great effect over the decades on that and many other issues. The Good Earth was one of her early books, I think about her seventh maybe, and the others were published after East Wind, West Wind was published, but it just was an expression of her heart, her soul, and her spirit, and I think in that, in 1931 when she wrote it, and then into the 30s with fascism rising up all around the globe, I think that Pearl was listened to in a very uh, wonderful way by the Nobel Committee and um, by people who were, they were honored her not just for her writing, but for her political, not just beliefs, but her expression of let's make this world work and let us look at this culture. We just come through the Dust Bowl and I think when the movie came out in 38, Americans just loved the good earth. They just understood it because here was a farmer. We thought that the Chinese were mandarins in all kinds of satins, long fingernails, or the insidious Dr. Fu Manchu. We saw them as some ancient and horrible villain, whereas they were, 80 percent of the country were these working farmers like Wang Lung. The biggest challenge for you as an actress must have been going in and out of these various characters, but you, you have perfected the Chinese <laughs> characters, and I know you worked strenuously on them. I did. Mm -hmm. Mike, I did not want to insult one Asian American or one Asian person, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, whom, whomever, but particularly I didn't want to do some kind of caricature that would be distasteful, so I worked very diligently. I went down to Chinatown a lot, many a morning, and just listened on Mott Street and watch the women, the way they talked, and they're arguing over a fish with a guy, or getting the, pro I mean, and there's a great activity, and it isn't austere and um, elegant. It's very almost, it, 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 by terms of my life, my Italian stepmother, or the, the Jewish people I knew when I fashioned Rhoda, it's a, like, eat this, and why don't you get married? And it's, it's boisterous and life-embracing and sense of humor that you would not believe. And I don't think Westerners were aware of that about China. Uh, Japan is a much more elegant, more British way of doing things. Uh, I don't know if that's because they're island people. That's what Pearl said. Maybe it's the tininess that they didn't see anything wrong with imperialism. Of course you go forth, we have no land. There's water around us, we have to conquer others. Whereas Jap the Chinese are very similar in their, on the most basic, uh, uh, in the most basic ways to Americans. 
because it's this big, huge country that has everything, mountains, streams, uh, land, desert, everything that occurs in nature is in America, well, maybe not tropical forests. Uh, well, yes, maybe Florida, yes. So it's that expanse of land and that so, so certain sort of energy close to the ground, farmers, that uh, is, is um, that she meant that people were culturally s different, not racially. So it was an interesting thing to me when in her writing that I saw her likening us to the Chinese and the Brits to the Japanese rather than Japanese to Chinese. I hear them. Soldiers, rude voices. Footsteps, loudly, passing and repassing. And they're stuck right outside the door. I draw my daughters close. War and conflict are so much a part of her life. That's a big challenge when you do a one-person show and you have one set, which yes. you have managed to create that aura. And I think a lot of it is your characterizations of these Eastern people and bringing them right to the brink. Oh, great, yes. And I have wonderful, able help from Rob Ruggiero, our director, who um, thought, he, he actually, and our set designer, Michael Schweigert, who said, let's make something that can just go to another reality with a rear projection or with a, we use actually slides and there's music and sound and of course the lighting and these rear projections which when I change they all change together and we did a lot of rehearsing on that Mike to make those transitions happen and there's the magic the audience is suddenly in a new reality it's her memory but and Pearl's still there but she looks different and sounds different and it, and the environment is different. The office goes away and she's in her memory. And my memory is a volatile thing. It really is. And we don't remember in linear uh, always. We, like I just told you, I saw my mother's blue eyes when you mentioned it saying, I love Pearl Book. She's wonderful. I mean, I was back, I was 11 when she was, had just received one of her Book of the Month Club selections. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I, I do um, appreciate that you, you saw that in the production. The background, as you describe it, is is the East. You are the West. I mean, inside this this little home, oh, yes. and then the ambiguity of the two. And there are even moments when they sort of fuse. Oh yes. Oh, and yes. that's what we're sort of hoping for here. She called herself culturally bifocal. <laughs> that's what she did. Said she really did. She said, "I see it. I see it so clearly." and I invite you all to see it. In reading your bio, I couldn't help but notice how similar you are to Pearl Buck. Oh. I, some writers have to, have to at least have mentioned the fact that you are involved in all these world hunger projects. Let me say that I would love to think that I was on Pearl's path. A lot of people are, but she blazed the trail, so I, the comparison makes me a little uncomfortable. I'm delighted to, but it, without waxing too humble, it's true, my concerns are, many of her concerns are mine. And I was working on racial equality and um, in this very city down this, it, um, just far, not far from the plaza, I picketed to in integrate industrial shows as a young uh, dancer and with a whole group of us, uh, Patrick, uh, Patrick O'Neill, who had the Ginger Man, it's now O'Neill's, yeah, and a group of uh, Harry Belafonte, there were a lot of us back in the 60s who worked on those issues. So. I think they're very basic issues that Pearl, she's just, it's just the golden rule. Do unto others as, although in China it's do not do to another what you would not have done to you. It's a little different. It's much earlier than the golden rule. That's, I guess, the Christianized or Westernized, same thing, but not exactly the same, and it's interesting. Do not do to another what you would not have done to yourself, and I think and I live, I try to live from that as much as I can. The most difficult thing in bringing all this to fruition, even in today's society, is that Pearl said, respect another culture, don't try to change it, and yet interwoven in this struggle is the whole civil rights issue, and that's something that we do have to come to the fore on. But how yes. do you get that message across without being perceived as, as colonizing? And when you say civil rights, oh, you mean the civil rights in China? Well, that's the, that's, that's the dance, that's the wonderful, uh, on the edge of the sword. That's the keeping um, your integrity 
uh, like Pearl could fully back Churchill in 42 as our ally, fighting fascism. She hated war, but she even, she's quoted places, Hitler needs to be tracked down like a dog and killed. I mean, she really <laughs> said that I mean, as much as she was a pacifist. She said, yes, war is necessary. At the very moment she was applauding and staunchly behind, she could say, and Mr. Churchill, Prime Minister, you are wrong about India. And the Indians were looking at America and saying, didn't you just have a tea party and throw them out? Right. And it's not that China's a great saint. No, the civil rights um, abuses are, are dreadful. But I think we can mark Pearl's words. They're going to, to be solved. And I, let's not worry about Hong Kong. Beijing, I think, days are numbered in many ways because of Hong Kong's power and its incredible reality in terms of commerce and the Chinese spirit, the Chinese working people. Pearl Buck lived half her lifetime in the East, half in the West. She began in poverty and ended her life as a millionaire, along the way winning the most coveted literary prize of all. She played a leading role in major 20th century struggles for human rights and established herself as one of the most powerful women of the century. She did as much as anyone in this century to see that all under heaven are one.